So we're in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 30 this morning. And I had Brother Frank read the entire chapter because these verses today, these 12 verses, are like a capstone to the entire chapter that we have studied, okay? And what these verses communicate are the blessings of faithful ministry partners. And Paul himself was in prison at the time of writing. Now, not in prison like we think of prison, but he was in a prison that allowed him to have basically his own apartment, and he was able to receive guests, and he was able to receive correspondence and also send correspondence, but he was being guarded by Roman centurions. And he was waiting trial, and he was unable to go freely. So he could, he could write, he could receive guests, but he couldn't go anywhere. And while he was there, um, his thoughts turned to a number of the churches that he planted, and he wrote uh, four different epistles. We call them the prison epistles from his time there. And Philippians is one of those epistles. So we have here, in verses 19 through 30, a portrait of Paul revealing his heart to the church. And he's also revealing his heart, but, but rejoicing in the fact that there are faithful men whom he can send to aid in the ministry of the local church. Okay, so if we're looking at verses 19 through 30, we can break this down into two sections. First, we have Timothy who is a faithful pastor and shepherd, okay? And then, that's verses 19 through 24. And then, in verse 25, we see the portrait of Epaphroditus, okay, who was not a pastor or teacher, as far as we can tell, but he seemed to be a faithful man of the congregation who was serving both the church and the Apostle Paul. Let's see how these two men and their service to the Lord Jesus Christ were an encouragement to Paul. First, our brother Timothy, a faithful pastor and shepherd. Listen to what Paul writes in verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be in good spirits when I learn of your circumstances. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned about your circumstances. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that when he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I evaluate my own circumstances. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will be coming shortly. So Paul's desire, okay, Paul's desire as expressed in these verses was to send Timothy to the church in short order. He expresses this desire with a present tense verb. I hope, I hope to do this, okay? It's not a certain thing, but there's a high likelihood that it will happen, okay? And I, I appreciate how Paul communicates his trust in the sovereignty of God through this language. Think about this. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Does Paul view it as an absolute certainty? No, he doesn't. He views it with the right perspective. Here is my intention. Here is my desire. Here is what I wish will happen. But my wish is in the Lord Jesus. That means under his control, under his desire, under his plan. And so if Jesus wishes for it to happen, if it's also Jesus's will for Timothy to go to the church, then Timothy will go to the church. So Paul had a great understanding of the intersection of his own plans and purposes and God's sovereign will for his life and for the lives of others. He says this again, the same phrase again in verse 23, therefore I hope to send him immediately. Okay, so he really, really wants to do this. You can tell that it is his desire to do this, but he's willing to allow the Lord to redirect his steps and the steps of Timothy according to the Lord's purposes. This is a common problem for us as American Christians, and I think it's a, un 
a very uniquely American Christian problem. We have a hard time grasping the intersection between the sovereignty of God and our own planning and responsibility to plan. American Christians tend to either go way on the side of God's sovereignty to the extent to say that we have no choice or agency, we can't do anything, we're just robots or automatons, and God is just up there controlling us and we have no freedom. That's one side of the pendulum. The other side of the pendulum is that we'll do whatever we want and just expect God to bless it. We're going to do whatever we want, and we're just going to expect God to bless it because we're Christians. So doesn't God want us to do whatever we want to do? Okay, so those are the two errors. And James points out the second error. This this was an error common not just to American Christians, but to other Christians in other eras as well. James points out this problem in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, when he says, you guys are foolish. You say, I'm going to go do this for a year, and I'm going to go do that for a year, and I'm going to go do something else, but you've left no room for the will of God to be enacted in your life. You just go do whatever you want as if God has no say over your life as a Christian. And those are the two errors that we as American Christians commonly fall into. It's very difficult to do what Paul did, to understand that we can make plans that we can have desires, that we can want to do things that are good and noble, like sending Timothy is a noble thing to do. That's a benefit to the local church. It's, it's okay to want to do things, especially for the kingdom of God. But we also need to leave room for the will of God to redirect us when he doesn't want us to do exactly what we've planned. And Paul had this happen in his own life on a number of occasions. When he wanted to go to one place on one of his missionary vision, uh, or journeys, and he had a vision in the night, and in that vision it said, no, don't go over there, go over here. You see, so Paul was familiar with how God worked. So Paul's desire was to send Timothy to the church in short order. He wanted him to come to the church very quickly. And Timothy was just going to be the front runner, okay? This reflects Paul's desire and Paul's personal belief that he himself would see the church again. Okay, so even though he was in prison, he had already written in chapter 1 that he hoped to see them again. And here again in chapter 2, he's expressing, I hope to see you again shortly. Paul's confidence was that his prison sentence wouldn't last long. Now, we don't know whether that's three months or three years. But Paul had confidence that he would be able to get back to the church. But until then, Paul was going to send Timothy. And in sending Timothy, Paul was really sending a part of himself to the church, which is the best that he could send under the present circumstances. What do we mean by this? Paul was sending a part of himself to the church. Well, we can glean from the text what Paul means. Let's take a look now at Timothy's character and the facts about Timothy that reveal why Paul thought that he was a worthy partner to send to the church. Let's take a look at verse 20. Paul says this about Timothy, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will be genuinely concerned about your circumstances. Think about the weight of that statement. Think about who Paul knew. Think about, like, the experiences that Paul had in all the salvations, uh, all the people that, that Paul had led to Christ, all the people that Paul had trained. And here he is from the prison cell saying, I have no one else of kindred spirit. This seems to echo what Paul writes later in one of his letters to Timothy, that all have abandoned me, except Timothy, perhaps Titus. But Timothy was a kindred spirit to Paul. What does this mean? This means that he had the same mindset and the same attitude that Paul had. This communicated to the church that when Timothy came, it was like receiving Paul himself. He was of kindred spirit. And you know that Paul was concerned both about orthodoxy and orthopraxy. What do those words mean? 
big fancy Latin words that we've brought over into English, okay? Orthodoxy is right doctrine. It is having correct doctrine interpreted from the scriptures. Orthopraxy is the practice of doctrine. It's not only do you have the head knowledge, but then you're able to practice that head knowledge throughout the activities of daily life. And you know as well as I do that this is often the real disconnect for us as Christians. We in America, especially in the West, do not lack for knowledge. We have multiple copies of the scriptures. We have computer programs that aid us in being able to see and interpret and understand the scriptures. We have all kinds of tools that we can gain knowledge by. And yet, we are often like elementary students when it comes to practicing that knowledge. And so when Paul says, Timothy is of a kindred spirit with me, not only did Timothy have the right knowledge about the scriptures, but he had the desire to practice it correctly as well. And he was going to implement that in the local church. And he was going to do this in a selfless way. Look at, look at how Paul says this. I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned about your circumstances. Timothy was a selfless individual. Timothy would be genuinely concerned about the circumstances which were surrounding the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi had different circumstances, different challenges than the church at Ephesus, and also different than the church at Galatia. And so Timothy was going to come in and he was going to examine what was wrong with the church, and he would seek to do what was best for them. Paul's statement here reveals that Timothy wasn't just some hired gun or contractor who would come into the church and tell people, it's my way or the highway. You do it the way I say or you get out. That's not how Timothy was going to act. Timothy was going to be selfless. He would be genuinely concerned about both the spiritual well-being and the practical well-being of the saints who were inside the church. Timothy would be putting into practice in a real-life way the command that Paul gave in Philippians chapter 2 that we read earlier. Remember verses 3 and 4? Paul says, "...doing nothing from selfish ambition or vainglory, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others." That's the attitude that Timothy was going to have as he came to the church. He was selfless. Next, you'll find that Timothy was a proven asset. Tim Paul found Timothy to be a worthy ministry partner because he was a proven asset. Look with me at verse 22. He's appealing to the Philippians here. He says, you know of his proven worth, that he served with me, in the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Paul now appeals in his um, argument for why the Philippian church should be thankful to receive Timothy and why Timothy was a, a faithful ministry partner and a blessing. Paul now reveals that Timothy was a proven asset. And he appeals first to the personal experience that the church had with Timothy. You know, Acts chapter 16, we don't have time to read it. It's like 50-something 50, 50 verses. But Acts chapter 15 is when Paul first encountered Timothy. He was a faithful young man at that point in his life. And Paul saw fit to train him as an elder, a pastor. And he brought him along on the missionary journeys. And Timothy was there at the very beginning of the foundation of the church of Philippi. And so the Philippians had a, a personal relationship with Timothy. Now, this is many years later. And so maybe they were thinking, well, he was just a kid back then, and he's just young and inexperienced now. But Paul's saying, look, you know of his character. You know of his proven worth. Don't overlook him because you may think that he's just the, the junior pastor. 
That's not Paul's attitude at all. Paul says, you, Timothy, are worthy, and you, church, should accept him as somebody who has been proven worthy. Paul knew that Timothy was a kindred spirit, that he was selfless, that he was a proven asset to himself and to the church. And he also knew this, probably the most important characteristic of Timothy, is that he was a faithful servant to Christ, found in the second half of verse 22. Paul says to the church in verse 22, you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Note, Timothy's first loyalty was not to Paul. Timothy's first loyalty was not to the church. Timothy's first loyalty was not to himself and what he thought to be true. No, Timothy's first loyalty was to Christ and the gospel. You see, Paul says, Timothy served with me. He didn't say Timothy served me. He didn't say Timothy served you. He said Timothy served with me in what activity? In what activity? In the furtherance of the gospel. Timothy was concerned about the same thing that Paul was concerned about, which was practicing and preaching and obeying the great commission that Jesus gave. Now you may say, well, Paul wasn't even saved when Jesus gave those words out. You're correct. Paul was not a believer at that time. But Paul became a believer many years later and had a personal experience, a personal training time with the Lord Jesus for about three or three and a half years. There's a three or three and a half year gap in the life of Paul. We don't know exactly what happened to him, but from the parts of scripture that we can piece together, it appears that the Lord Jesus came back from heaven to earth and personally trained Paul during that three to three and a half year period. And so do you think that Jesus told Paul exactly what the Great Commission was? Absolutely. Do you think Paul told Timothy what the Great Commission was? Absolutely. And so both of these men were faithful servants to Christ in the furtherance of the gospel. Once again, they weren't doing ministry for personal gain. They weren't doing ministry for money. They weren't doing ministry to try to gain something from the people who were in the audience. They were doing ministry because Christ had called them to ministry. And you know how diligently Timothy was devoted to this mission? Paul describes it like this, a great phrase of endearment. He said, he was like a child serving his father. Like a child serving his father. I had the great opportunity to have uh, Joel Decker and Ben come over yesterday, and I talked to Joel about his upcoming baptism today, which is already over. Great job, Joel. Thank you. You know, you did brave going first. But after um, we got done talking about the baptism, I had some home improvement questions for Ben. And there's Ben and I talking, and he's pulling out the tape measure, and Joel takes the end of it and goes right over to where it needs to be measured. His dad didn't even have to tell him what to do. He just went and did it. He knows. Why? He's faithfully serving his father. He's learning the work. He wants to be involved. That's exactly how Timothy was with Paul. He served Paul like a child serving his father. What a great illustration of Timothy's faithfulness. And, and what a high commendation. What high praise that Paul could give to Timothy. Timothy. They weren't seeking their own good, but they were seeking the advancement of the gospel. Now, this is a, a very important word in the New Testament, gospel. We see it frequently. Sometimes if you listen to Christian radio, watch Christian television, read um, Christian books or magazines or go to Christian websites, you hear the word gospel thrown around all the time. It's used in a lot of different ways. But when we see the word gospel used in the New Testament. It communicates something very specific. And what it communicates is, is this. It communicates the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus Christ. 
It's interesting. At Jesus' birth, the angels proclaimed good news about Jesus, that he was born. But now in the epistles, we see the word gospel used, talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's not just the announcement of the birth. It's the announcement of the work. Not only the work, but the finished work of Christ that is important. And this phrase gospel, this word gospel, that communicates the good news, says something specific about what Jesus did. You see, Jesus was the Son of God. He was born of a virgin, and he lived a life that was perfect. He never sinned. We studied this a little bit earlier in Philippians chapter 2. And because Jesus never sinned, he was found to be an acceptable sacrifice in the eyes of God the Father. A sacrifice for what? you say. A sacrifice for the condition that plagues all of us as individuals. You know, in my Sunday school class today, Brother Cece was teaching about the literal thousand-year reign of Christ that would happen after the tribulation period. And during the time of Jesus Christ's reign on the earth, Satan will be bound So he won't be on the earth to influence people like he is now. And during that thousand years, everyone who is born will live and exist under the righteous rule of Jesus Christ, where the exact justice will always be given. Never injustice and never non-justice. Always perfect justice and leadership. And for a thousand years, people will be born into that, and they will live underneath that. You know what the the text of the Scripture in Revelation says? At the end of the thousand years, Satan is released. And what does he do? He goes around and he deceives people from all the nations, and they turn against Christ in one final battle. You know what hit me this morning as I was listening to that? That settles the nature versus nurture argument to me. You've heard of that before? Nature. Why do people turn out bad? Did they have a bad nature or were they nurtured wrong? Well, the fact of the matter is they have a bad nature. They have a sin nature. And Jesus Christ came to this earth to be the appropriate sacrifice so that when he died, he would pay the price for the sins of you and I and any who have ever lived. And God the Father would look down on the sacrifice of his son and say, I accept this sacrifice. This pays the price. I accept it. And he proved his acceptance by raising Jesus from the dead three days later. And we celebrated that just a few weeks ago on Resurrection Sunday. And so the whole point of the gospel then is that you and I are sinners And we face the judgment of God. We deserve the wrath of God. We deserve all the justice that God can bring upon us. And yet, in Christ, we can be declared righteous. We can have the the righteousness of Christ put on our account so that he suffered so we don't have to. And that, that is an opportunity that is available for anybody. Salvation is a free gift if you repent and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the good news, my friends. This is the gospel. And this is what Paul was devoted to, and this is what Timothy was devoted to. So Timothy, we see his character as a kindred spirit to Paul, as a selfless pastor, as a proven asset and a faithful servant to Christ. Now we look at Timothy's commission. What did Paul want Timothy to do? Well, in verse 19, we can glean this, that Paul, or that Paul wanted Timothy to investigate the condition of the church and report it back to Paul. See, he says this, I hoped in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be in good spirits when I learn of your circumstances. Okay? And so uh, Paul was to investigate the church and send word. I'm I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Hold on a second. Timothy, there we go. Timothy was to investigate and send word back to Paul. Okay? 
So Timothy's arrival would obviously be after the letter, okay, because the church would receive the letter, and then they would be looking forward to Timothy coming. And in sending word to Paul, this would bring about encouragement to him. So one of the things that Timothy was to do was to investigate the condition of the church and report it to Paul. The next thing that he would do is to set things right in the local church, okay? And we've kind of already looked at this a little bit. In verse 20 and 21, Paul says this, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will be genuinely concerned about your circumstances, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. It's clear that there were individuals who were mm, using their leadership positions within the church to advance their own personal interests, not the interests of Christ. And Paul says, Timothy is going to set things right. He is going to be my man to come to this church and to set things right. He was going to put the church's welfare first. Again, this coincides with Timothy's character of being selfless. All right, now Paul says, look at what he says here. Timothy will be genuinely concerned about your circumstances. I want to point out this word concern to you. This word concern is the same word used in chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, be anxious for nothing. Okay, you could translate chapter 4, verse 6, be concerned for nothing. And also in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, be genuinely be anxious about your circumstances. But in Greek, just like in English, the same word can have two different meanings. So the type of concern or anxiety described in chapter 2, verse 20, is the healthy anxiety. Like, I have a desire to see things put right in this situation. That is a healthy desire. I have a desire to do what is right and to see things put right. But in in chapter 4, verse 6, the concern is an unhealthy desire. It's, a, it's an anxiety that attacks the mind and paralyzes you from action and prevents you from doing what God wants you to do. So here we see in verse uh, 20 of chapter 2 this godly concern that Timothy has, which is shared by Paul. And, and look, It's clear that this godly concern is contrasted with those who are self-interested. Okay? Timothy was not going to have an attitude of what's in it for me. What do I get out of this? Timothy was going to be looking to say, how can I serve Christ? How can I do what is best for the church? And so Paul was anxious to send Timothy in the good way, all right? A good a good anxiety, a good hope. He was hoping to send Timothy so that Timothy would be able to help the church by displaying the kind of fatherly love that Paul also shared for them. And so this, this is a portrait of a godly pastor who is a faithful ministry partner. And next we move to the portrait of a mighty man, a, a faithful man of the pew, okay? Okay if I can say it that way, a faithful man of the pew. So we're moving from the pastor to the pew, from leadership and the position of leadership to just the guy or gal who attends the church and has a responsibility to serve. We look now at Epaphroditus, who is a mighty man, in verse 25 and 30. Epaphroditus was a mighty man, We don't know very much about him. In fact, he is only mentioned here and in chapter 4 of the book of Philippians. And it does not appear that he was a pastor or evangelist in any way, shape, or form, but rather a faithful and well-respected member of the congregation. So when Paul starts to talk about Epaphroditus, he, he basically puts Epaphroditus into perspective for the congregation. And I think this is important. For all of you, Paul saw that Epaphroditus had great value to himself personally. And Paul also saw that Epaphroditus had a great value to the church. And then the third thing that Paul said is, hey, church, welcome this guy back who is one of you. Welcome him back. Hold him in high regard. 
All right, now let's see the breakdown of these three aspects of Epaphroditus' value and the blessing that he was. So Paul says in verse 25, I regarded it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. So by the time the Philippians are reading this letter, Epaphroditus has arrived. How do we know that? Well, it's most likely that Epaphroditus is the one who carried the letter from Paul to the church. He was there in Rome with Paul. He carried the letter from Paul to the church. So when Paul was writing this, he understood that it was going to be in the past tense. I regarded it necessary to send Epaphroditus to you. Now, this is what he says about Epaphroditus, and this is how we know the value of this mighty man to Paul. Paul first describes him as a brother, okay? He is my brother and my fellow worker and my fellow soldier, as a brother, Paul is not talking about him as a blood relative. He's talking about someone who shares a common faith in Jesus Christ. The word brethren, which is the plural of brother, is a common phrase that is used to describe the community of believers in the New Testament. And one of the great truths about this word, okay, brethren, one of the great truths about this word is that is an equalizer. The word brethren <clears throat> is not a respecter of social class, not a respecter of wealth, is not a respecter of ethnicity, is not a respecter of whether you're a slave or a free man. In fact, all who are saved in Christ Jesus from their sins are brothers and sisters in Christ. All have access to God the Father. All are baptized into the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes this in the book of Galatians, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And one of the great truths that we were able to witness this morning, even in the baptism, and many of you will, will know, know of, of other situations in our congregation, is that we have a, a lot of families who have adopted children. And we, as such a good picture of what God does for us, we are all adopted into the family of God, whether we're rich or poor, whether we were free or slave, black or white, or Asian, or Italian, or whatever your race might be. It doesn't matter. You were adopted into the family of God. We all have equal standing before God. And so Paul is able to say to Epaphroditus that he is my brother. Now, if you know anything about Jews and Gentiles, if a Jew heard Paul, who was also a Jew, saying that Epaphroditus was his brother, he would be disowned, possibly even stoned. You just don't cross those barriers. You don't cross those boundaries. But Paul had no reservations at all. Why? Because he was a brother in Christ. Paul says next that Epaphroditus was a fellow worker. He also worked alongside Paul in the work of the gospel. Now, Paul doesn't say how he did this or what kind of work he did specifically, but Paul evidently thought that Epaphroditus was laboring diligently in his service to Christ in helping him in whatever way that he did. And this is, this is fantastic, right? Because it helps us to realize that it's not just the pastors who do ministry in the local church. Right? It's just not, not my responsibility or Pastor Keith or, or Dave or Daniel or Ron or John. It's not our responsibility to do all the ministry in the local church. Now, we have a, an area of ministry that we are responsible for. But the saints have a, an even larger area of ministry that they are responsible for. And by Paul saying that Epaphroditus was a fellow worker, it brings value to that work that is not pastoral work. You see that? It brings value to that work that is not pastoral work. It means that if you don't ever preach a sermon, you've not somehow failed in your obligation to Christ. That you've not somehow short-sighted yourself. That you're not somehow doing less because the Holy Spirit has put each individual in the body and given them a gift to use for the blessing of the church. Epaphroditus was a great fellow worker in the partnership of the gospel. 
And now, finally, Paul says that he is treasured as a fellow soldier. This, of course, is a high compliment. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul provides some insight as to what he means by saying that Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier. Here's what these verses say. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, what is implied by this description is that Epaphroditus was focused on serving his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, in any way that was necessary or required. He was a faithful soldier. When he received a command, he did it. He understood the chain of command, that he wasn't the top, that he wasn't able to break away from the chain of command. But Christ commanded the pastors, and the pastors command the people through the word of God, and then the people practice the commands. And guess what? The pastors also practice those commands. And guess what? We all look to Christ for instructions on how to be good soldiers. Epaphroditus was obedient, faithful, and committed And we see here twice mentioned in these verses that he was sick, and sick unto the point of death. Look at verse 30. He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to fulfill what was lacking in your service to me. What does a good soldier realize? That the battle could cost you your life. The battle could cost you your life. And Epaphroditus was a man who was willing to risk his very life in service to Jesus Christ. What a fitting description for this mighty man. Now, he was of value to the church. Why? He was their messenger. He was sent by the church to deliver a message and a gift to Paul. We find that in chapter 4, verse 18. I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I have been fulfilled having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus not only served Paul, but he served well in the local church. He was a messenger to the church, and he was a minister to Paul's need. The word minister means servant, often indicating some kind of unique or specialized service. And we don't know exactly what he did for Paul. I mean, he obviously took the gift to Paul. We know that for sure. And he took the letter from Paul back to the church. That we know for sure. But what else he did, we're not exactly clear about. But whatever it was, Paul says, he was a great minister to my need. And he was so great of a minister to my need that he filled up what was lacking in the church's service to him. That's incredible. As a representative of the church, he represented the entire congregation well and filled up what was lacking in their service. And it's not from lack of desire, it was from lack of opportunity. Because Paul was in Rome and the church was in Philippi, some 800 miles away. Now Paul instructs the church concerning this man. It seems strange when you look at verse 29. It seems strange to think that one who is so well-loved by the church would need a recommendation from Paul for the church to honor him. Yet, I think Paul understood that one of the big factors facing the church in Philippi was disunity. And so in order to prevent further disunity, he gives the church a command, receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. The fact that he gives this command concerning Epaphroditus should bring unity to the local church for there would be no disputes or factions or arguments about what to do with Epaphroditus. I think this is instructive for us too. We are to receive faithful servants of the Lord with all joy, and we are to hold men like him in high regard. The word joy, again, comes to the forefront. This is the attitude of thankfulness 
that you have when you decide to act according to God's truth. So the church was to have an attitude of thankfulness and to receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with such attitude, not begrudgingly, not mischievously, not with some kind of ulterior motive, but with an attitude of joy. And then Paul says that uh, the church was to honor him, to hold him in high regard. You know, when you read the annals of church history, it is the everyman who is overlooked. Think about that. When you read the annals of church history, it is the everyman who is overlooked. I mean, we love reading the stories of men like John Knox, George Whitfield, the Wesley brothers. We love reading about missionaries like Jim Elliott and J. Hudson Taylor, who inspired thousands of people to serve the Lord more faithfully. But who is behind those men and their labors? Faithful men in a local church. Faithful women in a local church. Faithful believers who believed the Great Commission and were willing to sacrifice of themselves by sending away their best men, by allowing their best men to go and accomplish something that the Lord has commanded, and not only supporting them by saying, we, we are willing to release you, but also sending financial offerings and gifts and prayers so that the men could accomplish their tasks the everyman is lost in the annals of church history, but the everyman is just as important as the men they write biographies about. It is the faithful husband, the faithful dad, who serves his wife and his children week in and week out, who honors the Lord. That's how churches are strong and remain strong and continue to be strong. It's dads who lead their families towards Christ. Through their examples and their regular practice of the spiritual disciplines. And this church is full of those kind of dads, and I am so thankful to have all of you with me here. Our church is so blessed to have a lot of Epaphroditus's in our congregation. And you could see that Paul was blessed too. Paul was blessed not only by the pastor in Timothy, who was raised up, but by the faithful man Epaphroditus and by <clears throat> his work in furthering the gospel and whatever he was called to do. So brethren, I want you to consider how our local church is blessed both by the ministry of the pastors and of the mighty men who faithfully serve Christ in the ordinary means of grace. For my brother pastors, the thought that struck me as I studied this week was, do we share the attitude and mindset of Timothy? Are we concerned about the welfare of the church first and foremost, or are we, are we interested in our own interests? I think that's a question that we have to wrestle with, brother pastors. And if you are, are not one of the pastors, which is every one of you but five, okay, if you're one of the saints... Are you engaged in the work of the ministry like Epaphroditus was? Are you concerned about practicing the ordinary means of grace so that Christ can be magnified in your home, in your workplace, and in the local church? There's lessons for each of us to learn from these two portraits. And Paul was blessed by both of these men. And the church is blessed by their example. And I hope you all have been blessed through the exposition of this word today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.